This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 865, recorded on February 10th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here at the incubator, Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everyone. We have a, we have a new uh, arrangement here. It's very it's very comfortable. I've got my blue jeans on. <laughs> <laughs> this is update number one hundred and one. Yes, it's been a while. Yes, so uh, one hundred and one episodes. What are we up to here in the in the country? Um, so um, th- things are going in the right direction. Um, so let me, let me start off with my quotation and let's get right to our update on where we are. So courage is not having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. And that's Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and I, I know a lot of people are exhausted. We're going to get into the, uh, the fruits of that exhaustion, if you call them that, when we talk about masking. Um, but where are we? So case numbers across the U.S. are dropping quickly. Um, deaths look to have peaked. They're also dropping. Um, but let's put that in perspective. Um, we reached a peak of 3,563 deaths on January 26th, and they have dropped all the way down to 2,777 deaths on February 8th. So that's still very high. We're still seeing over 2,000 deaths per day, and everybody's ready to be done, right? <laughs> um, here in New York, just to give sort of the same numbers, uh, the peak in New York, uh, we're a little bit ahead of the curve on this. Um, January 18th, we were at 404 in a single day. Um, on that February 8th, just a few days ago, uh, down to 208. Still, over 200 people dying just right here in New York in a single day. Um, the case numbers, though, these are really dropping. Test positivity rates are down. Things are actually getting pretty quiet. I have to say that the urgent care is starting to get pretty quiet in the hospitals. I'm seeing empty beds. Uh, today I was in one of the hospitals and um, didn't take care of any COVID patients at that hospital. Went to another and there were just you know less than 20 in the entire pretty large hospital. Um, so um, I'm going to spend a little bit about talking about masks today because uh, they people want to turn this around. They're worried the hospitals are a little uh, too empty. Um, but in many parts of the country, um, mask requirements indoors, and then probably next month, school, it's going to go away. Um, I will say here in New York, Wednesday, the 10th of February, the mask or vaccine mandate expired. Um, so that is no longer a thing. Um, I took the train in. Um, I am unhappy to say there are a lot of people on that train without masks. Um, you're supposed to still be wearing the masks on, on airplanes, on buses, mm. on trains. Um, Vincent, were people wearing the masks coming in from New Jersey? Are they any better behaved than us New Yorkers? Yeah, the, last night, this morning, all masks. So today, the mandate expired in New York State? Is that what in, you're In New York State, yep. So it mm. used to be that a business had to either check, verify that you were vaccinated, right. or you had to wear a mask. Or they could kind of pick which one they were going to go with, either the mask or the vaccine. Some some institutions, businesses were switching. Like mm. some days it was masks, some days it was vaccine. You had to figure out which one. Um, now it's uh, sort of a free-for-all. But there's still a federal mandate for some Activities. Transportation. Transportation. Okay. So when you're on that train, when you're on that bus, when you're on that um, airplane, okay. theoretically supposed now, to. Now, Columbia University still has a mask mandate. Who are they marching to? <laughs> <laughs> well, schools are a little bit different, so I think it's good that you bring that up. All right. Um, in New York, um, and this is different in each state, in New York, there's still a mask mandate in effect until at least February 28th, and then it's going to be addressed. And so we're thinking in March, a lot of schools are going to be dropping. Um, a lot of parents, and we'll get to this, the timing issue, right? Mm. Those kids under five. Um, a lot of parents, boy, we've been keeping them safe for so long. Couldn't you have given us a little bit more time? So we'll talk about some dates on that as well. So we're thinking after spring break, when we come back, probably no masks. In a lot of states, I think that's going to be the case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could, could Columbia conceivably make its own decision or do they follow the state recommendations, do you know? They, they could conceivably um, okay. make some of their own decisions. Yeah, I mean, they could decide, for instance, even though mass mandates are, are sort of no longer required, mm. if they felt like there was a reason, they could potentially go a little bit longer. 
All right. We'll see I, I'm teaching right now in person, and I would very much like to not wear a mask. <laughs> now, I, I was discussing with the students yeah. yesterday, do you think we'll ever not wear a mask? And they think not because they think Columbia wants them to wear a mask. But they told me I could not wear one because I'm way at the front of the class. Okay. But I said, no, I want to give you moral support. I'll wear yeah. a mask. <laughs> yeah. No, I applaud that. <laughs> um, so let's go right into children, COVID, and mental health, because we're going to get back to masks a lot today mm -hmm. and have a little bit more of a dialogue, Vincent. I'm going to make put you to work today. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as we've been saying for quite a while, um, children are at risk from COVID. Um, and the data, the most recent data from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, so we have data up to the 3rd of February, looking at the week right before that, we are up to a cumulative 828 pediatric deaths from COVID. So mm -hmm. I'll say that one more time. 828 children have so far died from COVID. Um, this is 21 additional deaths just in that last week. So that's three children dying a day here in the US from COVID. Um, and it still kills me because whenever I say that, people say, well, they have comorbidities. Like they were chubby. Maybe they had asthma. Um, and it just, it kills me. I Like the best man at my wedding, he has asthma. I would be really upset if he died. So um, yeah, don't, don't keep asking me if they have comorbidities. We've talked about before, a third of all the children who end up hospitalized with COVID have no discernible comorbidities. Now, if I remember from last week, you said most of the deaths are in fact since August. Unfortunately, of those 828 deaths, the majority of those deaths have been just in the last six months, just since and August. And so a good number from Omicron. Um, well, those 21 deaths that we just saw, that's Omicron. So I think, again, people really got to watch that word mild, right? Yeah. 3,400 plus deaths in a single day. We're still at over 2,000 deaths a day. That's Omicron. So, you know, anyone who's maybe in a uh, political arena, maybe an elected official who calls this nature's attenuated viral vaccine, it's wrong. This is, this is not something you want to mess around with. I don't think the FDA would approve it as an attenuated <laughs> vaccine, would they? Uh, with the mortality side effect here, no. No. no, this, no. Is not, this is not the way to get immunity. The way to get immunity is through these well-studied, well-tested vaccines. Um, so I had a privilege of attending our pediatric, our pro-health pediatric summit meeting this Monday. Eventually, it'll be Optum Tri-State. We're under, undergoing a branding, but so far pro-health, <laughs> trying to keep all this straight. Um, but school safety was, was a big concern. So I want to talk a little bit about the updated CDC science brief. Um, so the CDC has a page you can go to, science brief, transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in K through 12 schools hmm. and early care and education programs. And they update this periodically. Um, and the most recent update, I'll, um, I'm gonna actually just read right from the website. Um, Although outbreaks in schools can occur, multiple studies have shown that transmission within school settings is typically lower than or at least similar to levels of community transmission when prevention strategies are in place in schools. So, you know, this is interesting. Like, I, I usually don't step at it and get yelled at that much. I guess I, well, maybe that's not true. Um, <laughs> but whenever I try to say that our schools can really keep our kids safe if they might th make the right choices, a lot of parents get very upset. Um, but it is true. Uh, but the CDC guidance uh, really talks about what are these prevention strategies that keep our kids safe. So let's go through. Number one, promoting vaccination. Um, now, evidence from studies primarily before vaccine approval, um, we're really seeing staff to staff transmission as much more common than transmission from students to staff, from staff to students, mm -hmm. um, or even student to student. Um, but seeing the really high amount of vaccination in our teachers, I think that's encouraging. Um, consistent and correct use of masks and this is interesting. They say for people who are not fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, sort of interesting because we we're sort of talking about not thinking about vaccination. But mm -hmm. as we've repeatedly talked about, vaccination um, does reduce your chance of getting infected. It also, we think, reduces your chance of spreading it to others if you are vaccinated. Um, and correct use. Um, this was, I was listening to the most recent TWIV and loving the comment about how the peak viral loads um, actually are in the nose. Mm -hmm. So if you're not covering your nose, what are you mm -hmm. doing? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, Barnaby and I were driving to school this morning, like pointing out all the people with like their nose just sticking yeah. out, you know? And when I was in Ghana, they always call, they call them nose masks. Mm -hmm. And so really pointing <laughs> out, it's gotta cover the nose. Yeah. 
Um, all right, physical distancing, um, screening tests, um, improved ventilation. That is huge. This is a respiratory virus. Um, I'm also hoping improved ventilation helps us with some of our other respiratory uh, pathogens. Now they throw in hand washing. Um, and that's something that was really kind of great they noticed in Ghana was that a lot of people have really doubled down on the hand washing and you should be washing your hands all the time. It helps with so many other mm. things. They were seeing less parasitic, less gastrointestinal, a lot of less other things because people are actually washing their hands. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times we've talked about where did everything go during COVID? Well, washing hands, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and hygiene, mm -hmm. hygiene is huge. Um, respiratory etiquette, right? That's coughing into your arm, not coughing into someone else's face. Hopefully you got that mask on. Um, this is a big one. Staying home when you're sick, right? You're sick. You, you don't really want to go and give that to others. Um, contact tracing. Um, and then again, routine cleaning. Let's keep the schools clean. Daniel, um, what's the proper etiquette if you have to sneeze and you have a mask on? Should you put your mask in your elbow? Should you take it off? <laughs> <laughs> and I think not, right? So now, now we're stepping slightly outside of evidence-based guidance, but yes, we're actually yes. using practical things. Um, you know, one of the things right, is pretty forceful when you sneeze. Yes. And we just talk about how we want that mask to be close-fitting to contain yeah. these respiratory um, droplets. And so if you actually bring up that arm, that's going to keep that mask tight against your face. And mm. I would think should help. But we need some of those cool laser studies, right? Okay. We can see what happens. <laughs> so, so we can make that evidence-based. Right. Uh, so here's exciting. Um, and this will be when we talk next time, we'll get to talk about this. But the FDA is meeting um, to look at the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine um, for children under five years. So mm -hmm. six months up to four years of age. That's going to be February 15th. Um, so this was announced on February 1st. This is going to be for children in this age range getting the three microgram doses. So a first one, three weeks later, a second one, um, while they continue to study mm -hmm. that third dose. Um, but I am going to throw this in. This is this is critical, right? I've seen all these these news articles. What's different? Well, um, we've heard that there will be a science brief that's going to go to the FDA, um, and this submission is going to be looking at the data on safety, tolerability, immunogenicity, um, and available efficacy on eight thousand three hundred enrolled children. Um, so we're actually going to see data in the coming days. We don't have it. You know, I mm. want it. I'm sure you want it, Vincent. Our listeners probably want it. Um, we're going to get that. And that's what this decision is based on. It isn't just a, oh, my gosh, let's go ahead and do this. The FDA encouraged this application. So we do expect there to be compelling data here for going ahead while they study that third. A lot of people keep asking, what if they find out that third dose doesn't really get us there? Well, we're hoping that this data that we, we see uh, tells us that we're getting mm -hmm. something and that's reasonable to have that expectation. So, so the two to five year old is an EUA application, correct? So this is an EUA. And we expect uh, it to be approved relatively quickly after the 15th, did you say, right? So we expect them to meet on the 15th. Mm -hmm. We expect on the 21st of February to be the day that people can start getting vaccinated. There's already distribution plans in place. Excellent. So um, there's a lot of, uh, there, there must be good data here if we're already getting mm -hmm. ready to distribute it. They already have the particular color caps to the bottles. So <laughs> I'm encouraged. And I know a lot of parents, not every parent is going to be, you know, rushing out on day yeah. one, yeah. but a lot of parents are really anxious to have this as an option. Um, all right. Um, we we'll talk a little bit of in our in our transmission testing. Never miss an opportunity to test. Um, I know people are exhausted um, <laughs> with the testing. A nice pile of tests I just saw before I left my house. Um, and I do encourage people to talk to listen to the most recent TWIV, so 863, um, where there was a big discussion on the safety, tolerability, and viral kinetics during SARS-CoV-2 viral challenge. Um, this has come up several times. I'm not going to discuss the ethics of uh, exposing mm -hmm. people um, to a virus, which um, you know is fairly novel still, which can cause long COVID, um, which may have long-term side effects we're not aware of. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was there, there's a lot here. There's a lot of data here, and one of my takeaway was this observation um, that if you look at those lateral flow tests, there's really a good correlation. Yes between the lateral flow tests and when people have um, viable virus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I liked about this paper is they're not just doing PCR. They're not just looking at lateral flow. They're doing um, viral, viable viral isolation. Um, 
And even just looking at the screenings, you know, if you if you did lateral flow twice a week, you were going to pick up seventy to eighty percent of viable virus people who are contagious. Um, you know, again, though, and this is also in that same paper, uh, what we've been recommending: if someone's been sick for a few hours, uh, stay home from school that first day. Still feeling crummy that second day? You're still home from school or work? That's the best time to test. You really see that symptoms start, the lateral flow, the other testing really has the best sensitivity little bit past 24 hours after symptom onset. So um, this came up a lot in our pediatric discussion. Um, kid wakes up, he's not feeling well, they want to come to the pediatrician's office to get cleared. You really can't clear them that first day. Mm -hmm. You really got to say, stay home, we want to test you tomorrow. So a little bit of triage there. The nice thing about home tests, it, it gives us that flexibility for $10, $12 to say, let's get a test tomorrow. Um, you, know, you can always do mm -hmm. that test right away, but that test tomorrow is going to really be key. All right. So this is going to be the meat of what we're talking about. We're talking a lot about mass today, Vincent. Um, and so, <laughs> so I want to discuss the MMWR report, effectiveness of face masks or respirator use in indoor public settings for prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection, California, February through December 2021. And there is a, um, there's an eye-catching graphic, we're going to talk a little bit about this, where they suggest in this, in this graphic, wearing a mask lowered the odds of testing positive, cloth mask, 56%, surgical mask, 66%, and a respirator, that N95 or KN95, 83%. Um, but let, let's go through this a little bit. So where did things stand prior to this publication and where are we after this? What is this study really telling us? So the use of face, face masks or respirators, so the respirators, right, are those N95, KN95, um, has been recommended to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, Well-fitting face masks and respirators are felt to effectively filter virus-sized particles in laboratory conditions. We mentioned a little bit about those cool laser studies. Um, but there, there aren't as many studies as a lot of people would like looking at the real-world effectiveness in preventing transmission or acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So in this context, the authors um, report results of a test-negative design, right? So you're having people come in, testing positive, testing negative. Um, it's a case control study, enrolled randomly selected California residents who had received a test result uh, for SARS-CoV-2 during this time period. So um, February 18 through December 1st, 2021. So face mask or respirator use was assessed among 652 um, case participants who tested positive and 1,176 match control participants who tested negative. And then what they're going to do is they're going to ask them um, self-reporting. Um, so they're going to ask self-reporting indoor public spaces during the two weeks preceding testing. Um, you know, what were you doing relative to face masks? So what did they find? So the people who reported that they had always used a face mask or respirator um, in an indoor setting, um, this was associated with a adjusted odds ratio of 0.44. So about a 56% reduction um, in them testing positive. And then they try to break it down. And they say, well, what about those folks who report they're wearing an N95 or a KN95? So adjusted odds ratio, 0 0.17. So about an 83% reduction. Mm. Um, the surgical mask, adjusted odd ratio of 0 0.34. So that's about a 66% reduction. And then they ask folks wearing a cloth mask, adjusted odds ratio, 0.44, so about a 56% reduction. Um, I will say wide confidence intervals when we get to those cloth masks. Mm -hmm. um, but what are the issues? I got a lot of issues. I'm going to bring you in on this, Vincent. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a randomized prospective control trial. Right. You're really just asking people, what are you doing? And a person who's wearing a KN95 is probably a little bit different than someone who's not wearing a mask at all in sure, indoor settings. Sure, yeah. um, it might be a difference in um, their interest in vaccination. Um, it might be their interest in going to these higher risk indoor settings. There's a big, um, big uh, athletic event coming up this Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think the person who's wearing a KN95 might not be enjoying that experience in mm -hmm. the same fashion that someone who has not been wearing a mask. So it's really tough. 
I mean, the numbers in my mind don't quite add up. Um, because this is really a study looking at when I'm going to use the term, I'm going to introduce this term if people aren't familiar, but one-way masking. We're not asking you, are you in a setting or a school or a business where everyone wears masks? We're just asking about your behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these numbers, the suggestion is, if you wear a surgical mask, you have reduced your risk by 56%. Mm -hmm. If you've worn a cloth mask, which we were told don't work at all, which we're going to get into, you've reduced your risk by 56%. I don't think that really fits with all the data we have to date. What we've sort of gotten is maybe there's about a 20% reduction. If you're doing it, the main benefit is to others when you're wearing it to contain those respiratory secretions. Um, there is a little bit of an interesting issue here, the cloth versus surgical. Um, the disposable mask versus something that you can wash and reuse. Mm -hmm. um, and I am a little bit concerned about this idea of all this trash. Um, I'm also a little bit upset because I like the fashion. I mean, there were there were people who enjoyed wearing masks sure, because they could sure. match with their dress, or in my case, their bow tie and socks. Um, you know, I'm sure Greta is not happy of us filling the oceans and landfills with all these disposable masks. Um, but this concept that you know you don't have to care what other people are doing because you can just wear a mask and you're going to get this tremendous amount of mm. protection. So. The message, don't you worry about mask mandates going away because you can get vaccinated, you can wear a mask, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. So the the difference between the surgical and cloth really is nothing because there's a huge confidence interval. So 56, yeah. 66, but they overlap. So huge overlap. I yeah. think they're the same. Given the limitations of this study, which you've pointed out, I'm sure the respirators are better and that's that's supported by these data, but it's yeah. not surprising, right? The problem here also, well, there's no people with no masks, right? Well, this is the relative risk compared, compared to the to people. no mask. Yeah. Um, the other, what, el what else were these people doing? What kind of <laughs> environments were they in? Were they yeah. people sitting at home alone or people in classrooms? How about vaccination status? That must yeah. play into it to some extent, right? So yeah. these are all the confounders that they didn't address. Um, yeah. I, I mean, mean, the right way to do this is the way the Bangladesh study was done, which mm -hmm. was a, C control trial where mm -hmm. some people wore masks and some people did not. And even with the limitations, those data are far more reliable. Yeah, right? yeah. I am, um, it's actually a researcher that I was flying back from, I was flying back from Africa prior, pre-pandemic, and they do a lot of these studies where they roll out interventions into, you know, one community and yes. then the next community, and then you sort of can see over time, um, you know, this community didn't, it didn't get rolled out, here you did it, you compare, like Bangladesh, introduce an intervention, versus don't introduce an intervention, compare. Um, yeah, I, I'm not as reassured as the study would like me to be. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of yeah. people will put up that MMWR graphic, you know, where you're, where your mask this much. I'm not sure this really jibes with all the data we have to date. I mean, this is a very easy study to do. You just ask people, whereas <laughs> yeah. the Bangladesh is hard. It's hard, it's that. expensive, right. yeah, um, but yeah. All right, active vaccination. Um, I like to say we need to stop scaring the wrong people. Um, and we have a couple updates here. One is an update on waiting to vaccinate after getting monoclonals, right? So for a while we've been saying, if you get those monoclonals, you gotta wait 90 days. Uh, never made a lot of sense to me mechanistically. This is not a vaccine mm -hmm. that is dependent upon a replication competent vector. Um, so the CDC has basically gone away with done away with that. So the CDC has removed any waiting period after getting monoclonals to get vaccinated. There's really no waiting period. If you get infected, um, if you test positive for SARS-CoV-2, if you've got COVID-19, um, as soon as you're no longer isolating for being infectious, so you're past those 10 days, you're feeling better, you get monoclonals, doesn't matter, you go right ahead, you get vaccinated. Um, and as we've seen repeatedly, um, even if you've been infected, Getting vaccinated still offers you decreased risk of infection, decreased risk of hospitalization, decreased risk of death. Um, I know a lot of people, oh my gosh, I recently had this. If I get vaccinated, I'm going to have a horrible reaction. It's not true. Millions and millions of people are tolerating those vaccines after infection. So continue to make that recommendation. Um, but what about, should we wait for those Omicron-specific boosters? <laughs> well, there was a nice uh, preprint. Um, mRNA-1273, that's the Moderna vaccine, 
or mRNA Omicron boost in vaccinated macaques, right? Those are our non-human primates, elicits comparable B cell expansion, neutralizing antibodies, and protection against Omicron, as posted as a preprint. Um, John Muscola is, is, is in there among the mm -hmm. 60 authors, so if people enjoyed John being on that time. Um, so it's a pretty impressive author list here. Um, but basically, these over 60 authors put this uh, preprint out there. Um, they looked in non-human primates who received either the Moderna booster, so the mRNA-1273, or they were given an Omicron-specific booster. Um, and if you go through all the data, there's a lot. Um, really, it was not clear that the Omicron boost provided any greater immunity than just getting boosted with that third Moderna shot. So they're challenging them with which with Omicron. So they're basically, it's time for your boost. The, the macaques, it's time for the macaques. So boost. the macaques were previously immunized. Previously immunized okay. with two doses of the the standard mRNA. All so right, all right. 100 micrograms. Three weeks later, 100 micrograms. Here we are, six months out. And so here was a choice: we're either going to give you a standard 50 microgram Moderna boost or a standard 50 microgram mm -hmm. Omicron boost. Okay. Looking all across, it looked like. Equivalent. And they're looking at disease or infection or both? So you're looking at immune markers. Oh, they don't really. get serious disease, yeah. the mechanics. Yeah, so right? you're really okay. looking at immune markers. So you're looking at CD4, you're looking at CD8, you're looking at neutralizing antibodies. Okay. Uh, a lot of data, actually. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to do, right? That what we really want to do is what about disease? So these are all those um, correlates. All right. Now, a lot of people are excited, still in the realm of vaccines. When can I get my nasal spray? There's a lot of people out there who don't <laughs> like shots. Um, so the, uh, the paper published in Cell, uh, Respiratory Mucosal Delivery of Next Generation COVID-19 Vaccine provides robust protection against both ancestral and variant strains of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this is a cell paper. So as you can imagine, it's incredibly dense. Um, you know, some, some people don't like needles. Some people are excited about this. Um, you know, excited maybe about the immunology as well as anything else, this focus on understanding um, mucosal immunology. Um, but what did the authors do here? So the authors tested um, adenoviral vector vaccines, so human and chimpanzee origin. Um, these were ad-vectored trivalent COVID-19 vaccine. So they're expressing spike, nucleocapsid, and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Mm -hmm. um, they're testing these in mice. I like to point that out. We're not even in human testing mm -hmm. yet. Um, and they reported that single-dose intranasal immunization was very effective at generating, um, they say, tripartite protective immunity, consisting of what are those tripartites? local and systemic antibody responses. So we got our antibody response, mucosal tissue resident memory T cells. Um, and this last pretty interesting, mucosal trained innate immunity. Hmm. Right? We don't really think of innate immunity as yeah. adapting and responding, um, but they were basically encouraging data. Um, but this is encouraging, it's still in mice. Uh, this data suggested that they were providing protection against ancestral um, as well as um, some of the variants. So encouraging, but still in early, early stage. This was given as a boost or as the sole vaccine? Sole vaccine mm -hmm. in these, yeah. Well, this would have to go through human trials, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. Is, are we able to do a clinical trial on a new vaccine at this point? Or in, it's gonna be a while before they're able to do it in people, right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Would this be something you'd look at as a boost? Is it something, yeah. I mean, there still, there still is, from a research point of view, there's still a whole cadre of people out there who've never gotten SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. and who are not vaccinated. So, so sort of maybe interesting. maybe for them a nasal spray would be appealing, yeah, right? Yeah, because they may, this may be sure. a population saying, I am not interested in that injectable vaccine, but I would be willing sure. to participate generate this knowledge, because some people maybe would be more comfortable with this uh, approach. I, I, I would look forward to the results. I, I would just say that the flu mist never does so well, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's influenza, so it's yeah. a different virus. All right. So uh, passive vaccination, we're still starting to get Ebu shelled out there. It should be Ebu shield, but now more places are making that um, accessible. And this is getting passive antibodies for those people who for some reason are unable to generate their own. It's not an alternative to vaccination. It's really a supplement for certain people. All right, the period of detectable viral replication. Um, 
This is the time for monitoring monoclonals, antivirals, enrollment in clinical trials. Um, but listening to one of the TWIVs a uh, couple back, I won't mention which uh, participant sort of prompted me to do some reminders here. Um, but just a reminder, timing is so critical here. If a person is at high risk, you can't wait to see if they start to decompensate. Once they get to day six or seven, once they start to enter that second week, once they start to get hypoxic, require oxygen, you've missed your therapeutic window for a lot of these mm -hmm. efficacies. So I know actually when there was discussion about the trial, well, if someone starts to do poorly, we could just jump in. It's kind of too late once they start to do poorly. So that's one of the issues. The challenge with that, trial, you mean? With the challenge trial. Yeah, you can't, once they're doing poorly and become it's hypoxic, you yes. don't have a lot of great therapeutics. Mm -hmm. Um, our great therapeutics are really in that first five days. So Paxlovid is, uh, these are in hierarchy um, from the NIH as far as recommendations. Paxlovid is suggested to be the first one to consider. It's about an 88, 89% mm -hmm. reduction if given in that first three to five days. Um, twice a day, you need to know their kidney function. Um, you need to know what other medicines they're on. If you can't do that, the recommendation is then look to get this person um, so trivimab, that's the monoclonal therapy that still works. Um, if for some reason you can't get access or there's a delay, um, remdesivir, IV outpatient remdesivir based on that New England Journal Medicine article. If you get this within the first five days, this is a 200 milligram right up front IV and then 100 the next day, 100 on day three. Um, and actually there are a number of places where this has been set up. I actually have to say on Long Island, the Catholic hospitals have set this up. Someone shows up in the ER, maybe there's a reason why they can't get the sotrivimab. Um, well, go ahead, get the first dose of remdesivir right then, and then set them up for the two-day follow-up. Then malnupiravir is that, that fourth line. If you have no other great choices, only about a 30% reduction in progression, but no issues with kidney function, no issues with drug interactions. But the big take home here is you can't wait. You've got to look if they're high risk and you've got to go ahead and treat them during your window. So in the challenge trial, none of those people were at high risk. Mm -hmm. And so... So they wouldn't really qualify for this anyway. Right. So, but then if they get in trouble... Then it's too late. Too late. Because they said they had remdesivir and monoclonals, but you would say it's too late if they're really... Once they start to decompensate okay. and become hypoxic, Do you yeah. think they told them that before they enrolled? Who knows? Um, yeah. One would hope so. I hope so. Um, it is tough. I mean, I will say there's a minimal benefit to someone getting monoclonals mm -hmm. sort of in the last seven to 10 days if they have not mounted their own antibody response. Um, okay. So, all right. So let's go to the tail phase, long COVID. Um, this is a tricky paper, um, you know, and, and I want to sort of make sure I go through this in the proper way. So there was a paper long-term cardiovascular outcomes of COVID-19 published in Nature Medicine. Um, and there, there really is a lot in this paper. So let, let's talk about what they actually did. So in this study, the authors looked at U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs um, National Healthcare Databases to build a cohort of 153,760 U.S. veterans who survived the first 30 days of COVID-19, and then they're going to compare these to two control groups. So a contemporary cohort consisting of over 5 million users um, with no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and then a historical cohort um, predating the pandemic with another almost 6 million um, non-COVID-19 infected um, veteran health affair users um, back from 2017. Um, and these cohorts were followed longitudinally to estimate the risks and the 12 month burdens of cardiovascular outcomes in these over, overall cohorts. Um, they looked at acute infection status, were they hospitalized, not hospitalized, were they admitted to the ICU? Um, and there's really a lot in here. And uh, this is open access, so our listeners can go to this. Um, Figure three is where I'm really going to sort of tell people if you want to just look at the figures to get a sense of what was going on. Um, so here they were looking at um, any cardiovascular outcome as well as breaking down specific ones. And just to really cut to the chase, right? So these are individuals who got infected 
um, got COVID-19, they were reporting about one in every 200 individual had some sort of cardiovascular outcome. Um, it could have been um, a rhythm disturbance. It could have been um, an inflammatory or an ischemic um, mm -hmm. issue. It could have been clotting. Um, so just putting that in context, when people are concerned about myocarditis and other risks with vaccine, we're talking maybe about one in 5,000 in the highest risk age group. But then again, this is something that usually resolves within about 24 hours. Here, you're looking at people 12 months later, one in 200, having some sort of cardiovascular issue. Um, now, as my wife pointed out to me, the data she wants um, is she wants to look at people that get COVID post-vaccine to see if the vaccine really reduces these cardiovascular risks, because mm -hmm. um, that's what we're hoping. We're encouraging people to get vaccinated so they avoid um, death, hospitalization, but we're also hoping it um, avoids all these negative cardiovascular outcomes as well. So the the incidence is largely in, in men of a certain age, correct? There's this sort of uh, teenage male, one in maybe 5,000 incidents mm -hmm. of in 90 plus percent of time. It's a one day of you know right. inflammation of the heart. So in, in COVID associated cardiovascular, do you see the same young men bias as well? Not necessarily, no, mm -hmm. which is interesting, right? You would have, you would have thought there would be yes. that sort of matchup. Um, you know, I'm not sure I understand the full mechanism. Um, it, it may be, and this is true, that um, older men are getting the most significant disease the more severe your disease, the mm, more yes, likely the yes. negative outcomes. Um, these young men usually have pretty, uh, pretty mild um, syndromes. But as we, we talked about previously, those athlete studies, COVID really um, likes to you know, anthropomorphize this horrible mm. virus. Um, it is often associated with um, cardiac issues in young athletes. Mm -hmm. So much right. safer to get the vaccine. Um, yeah, as my wife points out, we would like to really see this data showing that here's vaccinated, here's unvaccinated, sure. here's cardiovascular yeah. outcomes. All right. So now, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, I'm going to finish here with an article from PLOS, Neglected Tropical Diseases, uh, Perceived COVID-19 Vaccine Effectiveness, acceptance and drivers of vaccination decision-making among the general adult population, a global survey of 20 countries. Um, and I mentioned um, when we recorded the last two sessions um, that physicians in Ghana were reporting that there were some issues um, with social media misinformation about vaccines. Um, and they're starting to see hesitancy. Even some of the medical students were starting to have questions mm -hmm. um, because of stuff they had seen on social media. And I talked a little bit about how it might be nice not to give so much air to those individuals with their misinformation agendas. Um, but the purpose of the study was to determine the characteristics that might influence perceptions of COVID-19 vaccine efficacy, acceptance, hesitancy, and decision-making um, to take the vaccine among general adult populations in a variety of socioeconomic and cultural contexts. So the authors looked at these issues in 20 countries, Australia, Austria, Bangladesh, Denmark, Egypt, Germany, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Ireland, Malaysia, Myanmar, New Zealand, Nigeria, the Philippines, Scotland, is that really a country? <laughs> Sri Lanka, Thailand, <laughs> Turkey, and Vietnam. Um, they reported that marital status age, rural versus urban, socioeconomic status, education, and being in certain countries was associated with different degrees of vaccine uptake and hesitancy. Um, they did report that most participants felt that a healthcare provider's advice um, was critical in decision-making, um, convenience was important, cost was also important as well. Um, I thought it was interesting, it's sort of surprising. People who have been married Mm -hmm. are more likely to get vaccinated than people who've never been married. I thought that was just sort of an interesting, um, and some of the interesting stuff about age. Um, rural versus urban, rural less interested, urban mm. more interested. Um, so I, I think that um, one of the things that was a takeaway from this is they did find that most adults throughout the world um, believe that vaccination would effectively control and prevent COVID-19. Um, and most people said they would accept the vaccination if they had access if it was available. Um, so I think, again, this is this mm. call to arms. Um, based on some of the discussions I had with physicians in West Africa, um, it's a little bit more than just shipping vaccines to places. You need to think about cold storage. You need to think about delivering those vaccines. You need to think about staff. You need to think about supplies. And education is critical. So really a lot here that we need to do. 
Um, again, we're talking about giving people fourth doses when people haven't even had their first or second. In the United States, is there any issue in distributing vaccines anywhere? So a little bit actually, right? And I think this has come up on a few twibs. If you're in a very small rural community, mm -hmm. um, they want a certain amount of vaccines before they're gonna deliver them yes. out there. Not gonna just send you know, a vial of 10 for one person. You might have to get in that car, you might have to get on a bus, you okay. may have to organize as a community to make it happen. Um, so yeah, even here in this country, there's mm. some challenges. Um, all right, well, before we get to emails, um, I wanna say the Microbe TV fundraiser went incredibly well. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Um, everyone who sent in $1,000 or more who want one of these virology textbooks, uh, shoot us an email. Um, let us know. Um, we'll check, verify that. Um, and then we need your address. And if it's going to be international, we need your telephone number as well. Um, so let us know so we can get those books sent out to you. So, so some of you have emailed and said, where is my book? And <laughs> we're getting to it. But if you haven't, Daniel at microbe.tv and give us the information that Daniel just asked for. And in the next few weeks, we'll get your books out for you. All right. And let me say, we're now entering a new uh, fundraising phase. So uh, during the months of February, March, and April, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a total contribution of $40,000 to um, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Minimum donation of $20,000. Um, where does this money go? Um, this is going to go to support annual meeting travel awards. So these are individuals, particularly, um, I'm going to say people from uh, low income, low middle income parts of the world, um, so that they can come. Uh, we're going to preferentially uh, support women. We're going to be a little sexist here. Uh, really want to try to do what we can to help with uh, inequity throughout the world. So help us support American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. It's time for some email questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Sandy writes, I can't understand why the hospital rates and deaths are so high if we now have Paxlovid to help fight COVID. Do you prescribe this to your patients? How many? Does it help? Are people refusing it? Seems like if we now have this available to everyone, unvaccinated or vaccinated, it would help. No, so this is this is excellent question. Um, you know, my wife it was interesting. She she now goes on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter was new to me um, <laughs> before the pandemic. I was introduced to it like right as the pandemic be, began, and a physician was talking about this, um, and they were suggesting it was actually difficult for them to get Paxlovid. And, mm -hmm. and I will say we've been prescribing Paxlovid, um, but it is still in short supply. Um, so there's right. only, you know, so many thousand doses, you know, per week available in an entire state. This is ramping up. We're not going to have Paxlovid aplenty probably until March into April. So, yeah, this as right now, it's not that easy to get to. There's only a few pharmacies or hospitals or other locations in each region where you can pick up the phone and call and get it set up. But again, it's not an easy lift, right? They come into your center. They see a, a provider. That provider has to know that this is the way to go. We have mm. to stop giving everyone z packs and steroids, shutting down their immune system when this is the time to let that vaccine protect you. Um, so that's number one. They need The clinicians need to know this is available. They've got to get on the phone. They've got to talk to that pharmacist. They've got to run through What's the kidney function? What are the drug interactions? Um, so yeah, this is not a plenty. You know, we're seeing thousands of people. And the other is the timing. You really gotta be on this. And this is the public as well as providers. This is a medicine that has its efficacy if given in those first five days. If you wait until someone's having problems and it's starting to get hypoxic, you're really missing your window of efficacy. Right. Joy writes, I've crossed the 24 month mark and belong to many large long haul COVID groups. I've noticed the majority of people who continue to be severely impacted by LHC are mostly on the same initial infection alpha timeline. I've seen very few who had Delta and or Omicron as their initial infection. I'm not including those who were reinfected later in 2021. I would love to know if you've seen any differences between the variants and their long-term impact. Yeah, so I would love to see a study on this, Vincent, um, because yeah, I, I still have a, a cohort of patients who got infected early on, so March, April, um, and you know, still continuing to suffer. Um, I certainly have seen um, people 
who with some of the newer variants have actually developed long COVID after them as well. Mm. Um, but I don't have any really good hard numbers. Um, but this, this may actually, I mean, it sort of goes with this perception. Um, I don't know if those people are less hesitant to come to me because they're not mm. vaccinated and they're a little yeah. bit, you know, but there certainly are unvaccinated people who got some of these newer variants who are suffering from long COVID, particularly prominent individual who treated themselves with Pepsid, now has long COVID. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know the exact numbers relative to long COVID, but I think this is actually important stuff to, to yeah. have, yeah. you know, and I, and I would love to know even, you know, better, different variants, unvaccinated, different variants, first, second, you know, mm -hmm. vaccination status and the rest. But we do know that vaccination and being infected the, the the long COVID rate is much less than unvaccinated, correct? So so not only is your risk of low long COVID reduced, not it's not mm -hmm. gone, it is significantly reduced, but even the severity and the duration seems to be impacted positively um, by vaccination. So even if we're seeing long COVID afterwards, the cases mm -hmm. tend to be not as severe, and we're also seeing quicker resolution. So. Is any long COVID associated with just vaccination? There is, there is, and I, I don't know if I would call it long COVID, but there are people who have gotten vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you vaccinate hundreds of millions of people, right? There are certain people who after that vaccination are having problems, sort of almost like a chronic fatigue, yeah. inflammatory issues, um, almost a syndrome in and onto itself. Um, but yeah, in some ways resembling incredibly uncommon, but we definitely see it, you know, when you're a specialist like myself. All right. Molly writes, I'm curious what the positive controls are for COVID PCR and antigen <laughs> tests. What antigens or nuclear, nucleic acid targets are suitable for constitutive detection? I've been able, unable to find a clear answer. And Molly is a PhD candidate at Harvard. So maybe that's where this is coming from. Yeah, yeah. No, these are these are good questions. And I think we've we've brought up the issue before that if you don't do these tests properly, you could end up with false positives. And that's really where this is. What, what's the negative control here? So, you know, that individual who maybe they're drinking orange juice or soda mm -hmm. and then sticking that Q-tip in the back of their throat instead and it's turning um, positive. Um, you know, the, the tests, most of those ones, particularly over the counter, they don't have a really good negative control to make sure you're not doing something mm. that just messes with it. If anything, there's a control so that you see that the test worked, but there isn't much of a negative control. Yeah. All right. So for both PCR and antigen, well, well the antigens that you do in, at home, there's a built-in There's control, a built-in right? positive control, right? Yeah. Control line comes up. Yeah. But there isn't a negative that says, hey, you messed up and did something you shouldn't, like sort of a nonspecific. Um, PCRs, though, um, the, the PCRs are actually, usually they have multiple targets. So that's sort of part of the quality control, but not like a real negative, right? So, yeah. If I remember, the, the lateral flow, the positive is just an antibody control. It's not actually antigen in there, correct? Yeah. It's just to show that the, the, the assay is working. Yeah. Uh, our last one is from John, who is an MD, and it's just praise. And I thought you would like some, so you don't have to answer a question. Okay. <laughs> praise is good. <laughs> it just Having just listened to clinical update number 100, I want to thank you for your devotion to providing such great, well-prepared clinical information, your ability to cover such an incredible amount of literature and combine it with your clinical perspective is amazing. When SARS-CoV-2 pandemic struck, I felt discomfort at being a retired ophthalmologist sitting on the sidelines during what promised to be a hundred year storm in medicine. I was able to relieve some of that unease by joining the Virginia Medical Reserve Corp working on projects at our district health department office and becoming a vaccinator. Having your updates as well as many of the other Microbe TV podcasts was a great source of information, as well as being a good antidote to the misinformation from online and media sources. I've recommended your updates to many other physicians and friends, one of whom is a retired NASA engineer who follows you religiously. Thank you, thank you, thank you. John. Okay. Well, thank you, John. And actually, John, thank you for getting out there, coming out of retirement, um, helping with the vaccine efforts. Um, you know, thanks for the praise, but there's a lot of praise. You know, a lot of people's true colors have come out over the last two years. A lot of people, not so great, but a lot of people have really <laughs> stepped up and made just a tremendous difference, a lot of sacrifices. So thank you for, um, you know, and all the people that support us, allowing us to do this. You know, we, right. we couldn't do this without the support of our listeners. Yeah, this lovely wall of <laughs> viruses from your contributions. Yeah, and I couldn't do this without Vince's support. So thank you, Vince. Sure, also. thank you. 
That's COVID-19 clinical update number 101 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you, Vincent, and thank you, everyone, and be safe. 